you have your Bibles or your tablets or your phone, we're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Thank you, Brian, Chase, and Lane, and Tyler, and Terry, and Courtney, and Ashley, and Cody, and Kylie for filling in for us all these weeks. You guys are doing a great job. We appreciate it so much. Keep in mind the number I'm about to give you. The Civil War has been over with for 155 years, about. 155. Matter of fact, everybody say 155. Okay, stay with me now. Keep that in mind. The last person to receive a Civil War military pension died in North Carolina last week. Hang on. There's more to the story. The Wall Street Journal reported that Irene Triplett died at a nursing home in Wilkesboro on May the 31st. She was 90. Now you're thinking, wait a second. 90, 155, how does this work? There's more to the story. Irene Triplett's father, Moses Triplett, oh, Mose was a Confederate soldier who deserted in 1863 and joined the Union forces in 1864. He married Irene's mother, Alita Hall, in 1924 when he was 78 and she was 28. <laughs> oh, Mose. Oh, Mose Triplett was 83 when his daughter Irene was born. I'm leaving that right there and moving right on. When you hear stuff like that, you need to have it in context, and here's the context. See, it was common for young women to marry elderly pensioners to get a guaranteed lifetime income. So during that time frame, younger women would marry the older men who had served in the war because they would get their pension, as was their children. So old Moe's triplet's first wife had died a few years before he married Alita Hall. He began receiving his pension for his service in the Union Army in 1890. He died in 1938 at the age of 92, just a few days after attending a reunion in Gettysburg, marking the 75th anniversary of the battle there. Irene Triplett began receiving a monthly pension of $73.13 from the Department of Veterans of Foreign Affairs. Yesterday, when this article was written, it would have been June 2nd of this year, yesterday was the first time since the 1860s that the U.S. government has not been paying a monthly pension to either a Union soldier or one of their dependents. Every Christian in this room, every believer watching by live stream, you are receiving a pension. You are receiving a benefit because a family member of yours fought and died. And what was probably the most epic battle in all of history. Not 155 years ago, but over 2,000 years ago. A Jewish carpenter was nailed to a cross on the hill of Calvary. And Roman soldiers there officiated his execution. They knew when he had died. And on that day, on that hill, the greatest battle ever fought in the entire world was fought and was won. And the victory was declared because Christ covered the penalty for our sins by his sacrifice and his death on Calvary. And today, not 155 years later, but over 2,000 years later, we still receive a benefit and a blessing because of what our older, elder spiritual brother did for us on the cross of Calvary. Amen. And we come here today on the first Sunday of each month at Christian Fellowship because this is when we have chosen to observe what is called the Lord's Supper or communion, or if you come from a more liturgical background, the Eucharist. But we take bread and we take cup and we remember what Christ did for us that we might still, and though it seems like a long time after the fact, still receive the benefit and the blessing of that communion. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. 
Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Today, as we begin this part of the service, prepare your hearts for communion. I'm afraid to say what has happened in far too many churches is that the communion service, the Lord's table, the Eucharist, has just become something that we add on to the regular service. It just becomes a little bit of a ritual that we do, that we have become accustomed to, that we have somewhat take for granted. But in this plan that God has for us in the New Testament, we are never told to sing a song in a church service. We are never told to preach a sermon in a church service. But he did say, do this in remembrance of me. So when we come to this first Sunday of each month, communion is not something we add on at the end of the service. It is the service. The entire moment from the time we enter the building to the time we leave should be focused on what we're going to do when we come to the Lord's table. And this is important to us because God calls us to do so. And in scriptures this morning, I want us to see that there are three components. These are just three small components. The picture of the Lord's table and Lord's supper is so huge, theologically, biblically, spiritually, practically. It covers so many things. These are just three, the tip of the iceberg I want to cover today. This service that we are in is a service of testimony. It is a service of communion or of sharing. It is a service of remembrance. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six. 26, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Sometime back in a previous uh, communion service, we talked about that word proclaim. And, what it, and, and literally what it means, what it refers to, it is like when a king would enter a room, they would, they, would, they would herald his coming. And it's also pretty much the same word that is used for proclamation and preaching in the New Testament. So when we take communion this Sunday from this side of the room all the way over to this side of the room, this room is filled with preachers. When you take the Lord's Supper and you proclaim his death, you are proclaiming, you are preaching, you are declaring, you are becoming that salt and light that this nation and this city needs. You are proclaiming, you are preaching it every time you pick up that bread and that cup. So this is a service that we proclaim. And there's some, there's some people in this room some of us in this room, we, 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 get, we have some consternation sometimes when, when we see them, but there's some people in this room, they proclaim the Lord because they realize where they have been. There are people in this room who can tell you how many days, how many months, how many years they have been sober. There are people in this room who can tell you their deliverance and tell you their story. Some of us in this room who had the privilege of growing up in church and never had anything. I, had, I, I never smoked marijuana. I grew up in the 70s. I never smoked marijuana. I had it offered to me one time. I was down at the beach surfing, and a guy walked over. There was a little group of them. You could smell it all the way down the beach. He said, dude, <laughs> you want some? I said, no, thank you. I get the same effect when I take my glasses off real fast. I'm good. <laughs> I'm good. So, but we realized there's still sin that separated us from God. And no sin is greater so much than any other sin but the ones who have felt like God has really delivered them, they understand and they like to proclaim their deliverance. They like to proclaim what God has done for us. And there's too many of us in the church today. I remember the song, there's a chorus that we used to sing, Cody, that says something like, uh, oh, oh, good, no, 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 I forgot the song right now. Oh, uh, and you don't know the song I'm talking about, so you can't help me at all makes me want to shout. When I think about the things the Lord has done for how he raised me, how he saved me, how he filled me with the Holy Ghost, it makes me want to shout. Too many of us have lost our shout. We have forgotten where God has brought us from. We have forgotten that no matter if we were born and raised in church and all we knew was Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night, we have still forgotten that there was a sin that separated us from God, and God bridged that gap by that death on Calvary and brought us into a relationship with him. Therefore, we proclaim what God has done for us. And when we come to this table, we remember that. And we focus on that and we think that and we thank God for that. And I'm sure that's the reason why the Bible says we are to proclaim Jesus and his death until he returns. 
Our proclamation should always be on our lips. It should always be a part of our life. The Lord's Supper reminds us of the fact that we have a testimony and God wants us to share it with others. And you can do that very simply. We, we had about a dozen families do it last night. Because of the pandemic thing, we didn't do our big fall festival that we normally do. So we got hot dogs and buns and everything for people to do it in their own houses, in their neighborhoods. And you were able to proclaim when you did that. All you did was hand out a free hot dog. But you were proclaiming. At our house, we had the two little yard signs that said Christian Fellowship. Lady came up and got the hot dog and she said, thank you, Christian Fellowship, for the hot dogs. Just a simple thing. But the proclamation that happened and that occurred. It's a service of not just proclamation, it is also a service of testimony, it's a service of communion. Communion means sharing. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 16, Paul writes explaining the, the, the communion process and he says this, is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation in the blood of Christ and is not the bread we break a participation, a sharing in the body of Christ? As we come to the supper, one thing that usually comes to mind in this communion is the fact that many, we would rather call it Lord's Supper or communion. The first thing we need to think about with this is that the Lord gave his life that those who believe could share in both his death and his life. And that's a deep thought to try to understand. A lot of times we think, well, if I just go to church and if I invite Christ into my life and I just kind of sing or whatever, my life, I just, I just live a better life. I become a better person. That is not it at all. You are changed from the inside. When you invite Christ into your life, there is something that we can't even explain with our words that mysteriously and miraculously happens because what happens is all of your past is forgiven. It's washed away and you live the rest of your life moving forward, God justifying you and making you right before him. We share in that. This was the most perfect sacrifice that could ever have been given on that cross. For thousands of years before that, the Jewish people, the Hebrew people, they brought animals and they had to be spotless without a blemish in order to be sacrificed to atone for their sins. But here was the one time that no other sacrifice was needed. Jesus Christ was the only one who could do that. And this perfect sacrifice comes forward and the Bible says somehow he comes into our heart and we share that. And as a result of that, no matter what I've done, no matter what I've been, no matter what I've said, it's forgiven and justified. I share in that when I hold that cup and that bread in my hand. Second thing that comes to mind about this communion on, on this part of it is that the roots of our communion as Christians come from the Jewish Passover. The Jewish Passover was a phenomenal celebration and still is for the Jewish people. And it was so much about family. Several years ago, God began dealing with me about communion and the Lord's Supper because I felt like in, in, in just so many churches, it just became a ritual, just kind of something that we do. And it was really just not thought about, just, it was just kind of, it was just done. And God began to deal with me on this. So I began to pray about it and study and look at it. And, the, and since our roots for the communion came from the Passover, it was a family-oriented thing. The Jewish people brought their children in. They explained what they were doing. There were illustrations. There were things that, that taught them life lessons in that. So I thought, well, we got to do a little bit something different in our communion service. So this has been six, seven, eight years ago. We're going to have family communion. We're going to bring the kids in on Sunday morning. That Sunday with the kids will be in. The, and the family will take communion together. You know, I had a couple leave the church over that. They sent me an email in all capital letters, so I knew they were upset. <laughs> and, and, and after a few months after that, we realized something. All the families stopped coming on family communion service because mom and dad didn't want to mess with their kids in the service. So we had to adjust it, and what we do now, we're going to start it for family communion, is mom and dad is going to children's church for communion. But it's a sharing of family together. And sometimes we will take family communion that and before all the pandemic stuff, the communion elements will be up here and you would come as a group with family and friends and take communion together. But that is the roots of what this is. See, and how they developed and what Paul was writing to the Corinthian church because they had gotten things. And you know, we do this in Christianity a lot. There is a good thing that comes along, but after a while we turn it into a bad thing. The church can mess some things up. We're human, we're, we're, we're flawed, we can mess some things up. So what was happening was this thing called the love feast. And this was part of what grew into uh, a communion for us. The church in Corinth, everybody would come for this big meal. 
and it was a wonderful time. Everybody gathered together, they shared, but as time went on, this person kind of got aggravated with this person. I know that's hard to believe that it would happen, but it did. And as time went on, what happened is this family, who might have a little bit of extra resources, brought their food, and they would sit down and start eating for anybody else because they didn't want to share their food with anybody else. So the people who didn't have as much would come in a little bit later, and there would be nothing for them. And Paul said, I'm not boasting. I'm not bragging about you with this. You have messed this thing up. It is supposed to be a time of sharing. 1 Corinthians 11.33, so then, my brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. The spiritual lesson for us here today is this. All across this room and watching by the live stream, we are all at different places in our walk with the Lord. Some are here, some are here, some are here, some are here, some are here. And sometimes we have to be patient and wait for somebody to kind of get to the right spot where God can lift all of us up together. And when we come to this table, this should be a place of complete and total equality. It doesn't matter what car you drove in, doesn't matter what clothes you're wearing, doesn't matter where you live. At this table, there is nothing but brothers and sisters in the Lord. It is a sharing. Now, there will come a time when for the good of the whole being, you need to return to the house of God. I say that, and because I've said this from the outset of this total pandemic thing, it is not a test of anyone's faith to be here at church. If you are home today because you have underlying conditions, you're not comfortable getting out with people, we understand. No condemnation. You don't show up until you're comfortable showing up. But I'm telling you this, a day is coming, you've got to get out of that house and get back in this house. If you are going to live the Christian life, you cannot do it online. There is something about the family of God that calls us together. If you want to come in with a mask and gloves and a hazmat suit, I don't care, but you need to be in this room. Somewhere down along the line, people are going to get a little comfortable staying at home watching church in their slippers and their pajama pants, just like they're going to Walmart to go shopping. And here you get, there's, there's, that vaccine is going to come out. You need to get that vaccine. You need to get back in the house of God. There is something about being in this room with this family when we worship together and we commune together that the Spirit drops down and says, I, I know he touches you in your house. I know that. I understand that. But this is a place where, the, where Paul said, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. And so much more as you see the day approaching. The mission of the church, I'm going to be sharing this with staff and board in a couple of weeks for the things that God's laid on my heart for next year. The mission of the church is too important for us to make excuses because of a pandemic. We cannot, well, you know, it'll probably never be the same again. You probably won't get back to that. I forget that. What we are called to do as a church to make disciples, to proclaim the gospel, and to proclaim what God has done for us is too important for us to sit back and say, well, it's probably never going to be the same again because some people are going to, no, 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 no. We have got a calling from God that supersedes anything. And we are called as a family to pursue that and do that. So it's a time of, of sharing. It's also a time of remembrance. Jesus tells us to follow some prescribed spiritual actions. Otherwise, we kind of miss out on what the true meaning of this is. And he tells us uh, in another spot in Corinthians, he says, bring every thought into captivity. Is that a struggle just for me or does anybody else? Kind of battle with that just a little bit. When we come to communion, and his inscription, instructions to us was, do this in remembrance of me. The thing you need to do to tell me to not think about something is tell me to not think about it. <laughs> now, when I come to this table and I take cup and bread in hand, I am supposed to think about Jesus. And I am given an example. I'm given an illustration. I have the bread, which represents his body. I have the cup, which represents his shed blood. So, I'm, so God knew my mind, and he says, I'm going to give you a little bit of help so you can remember what's going on. Now, a lot of times we can do some good things during communion. A lot of times that we can think about how the Lord has been good to us and what he has done for us and how he saved me from all the things in my past, and that's good to remember, but that's not what you're supposed to think about during communion. All of your thought process, everything is to focus on Jesus. This bread represents his body. His body was broken for me. 
They had a whip that I can't even begin to describe that they slashed his back with. They had a crown of thorns. Several years ago, someone somewhere was vacationing or somewhere, and they brought us back what was a crown of thorns, what they believed to have been uh, what was placed on Jesus' head. And that thing was so dangerous, I stuck it out in the garage. I mean, it, just, just to touch it. But, and to carry a cross when you have been beaten like that for, for, day, for a couple of hours now, the, the things that are going, and carry the cross. Everything his body had to endure. And the thing that is important about that part, when you read a little bit further in Corinthians, he'll say, the reason some of you are not well, the reason some of you are sick is you're not discerning this body properly. Now, the implication is this. If we do discern it properly, that means the stripes on his back for our healing, Isaiah 53 and Peter's writings in the New Testament tell us both that, that if we partake properly, focused, you can be healed while you're taking this. I believe the supernatural is the song they sang earlier. Some of the diabetics in the room, you can be healed when you take this. Your back pain can be healed when you take this. Your cancer can be healed when you take this. This pushes us out of our comfort zone. The reason why some people didn't like when we brought the kids in or when we did family, because it pushed us out of our comfort zone. I'm, I like it when I sit here and somebody brings me the tray and I don't have to do anything other than that. But that's not what this is about. When you look throughout there, he talks about the connection, the family, the relationship that is there that is represented. So that, that when, when you hold <laughs> it, it ain't bread, it's styrofoam. And these things, you know, I'm sorry, maybe we'll get back to the real stuff, and all, but that's, that's just the reality of where we're at. You're eating a piece of styrofoam. But, uh, w but when you hold that, it represents that body of Jesus. And when you hold that in your hand, God, bring every thought into captivity this morning for me. And let me just do this in remembrance of him. The juice, it represents his shed blood. And that's another thing we don't like to talk a whole lot about today. Uh, there, there are even mainline denominations in their hymn books. They have removed the hymns that mention the blood. Because it's just kind of a disconcerting thing to think about and sing about. But, but you can't get by in Christianity with the shed blood of Jesus Christ. There is... Grandma used to sing it, there's power in the blood. Grandma, grandma used to pray, I'm, I'm, playing, I'm pleading a bloodline around you, grandson, that God will take care of you. There, there's, there's something in here that we can't imagine that is just, again, that I think just goes beyond our finite understanding. But in God's economy, he says, this is how I'm going to save you. This is the price that has to be paid in order for your sins to be washed away. So when we take that cup this morning, we are realizing the price that was paid and even though it's more than 155 years ago, it's 2,000 years ago, we're still receiving a pension. We're still receiving a check today. We still get a benefit because one of our family members fought and died for us. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is just the tip of the iceberg of communion, of the Lord's table. Never just go through it haphazardly. Never go through it without really contemplating what it really entails. It is so easy for us to take it for granted. But I want you this morning to think about what communion means as we partake. So, Cody, would you come back with me? If you were, if you were not uh, handed uh, the elements when you walked in, Dennis is back there with some. Rex, is there, is there some there by you? If you guys would bring them down. If you don't have the cup uh, and the bread, if you just raise your hand, they'll come to you and they'll find you bring it to you. Rex, when you get done, the Matherns over here to my left. This is the Lord's table. Rick, I'm visiting today. I've, I've, this is the first time I've ever been to this church. It's not our table. It doesn't have our name on it. It's the Lord's table. So we have no means to control it. If you have bowed a knee to Christ, you're a Christian, you believe in him, he lives in your heart. Today, you are family with us. Today, you join with us. Today, you commune with us. Take the, the package and partake with us today.